It takes only an hour to cross the Naf River, which divides Bangladesh from neighboring Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. But as they struggle onto firmer ground, these families are now refugees, looking to the Bangladesh government and the relief agencies for shelter, their health and sanitation needs, water, and of course, food. A of a million Rohingya Muslims have fled their homeland to live in camps like this, which have sprung up along a narrow coastline of southern Bangladesh since the start of 1992. Abu Shama, a peasant farmer, arrived here in early April with his family of eight. They are surviving, but only just. Aid agencies, the Bangladesh government and the UN have mobilized their resources to help the Shamas and the camp's burgeoning refugee population. Health, sanitation and water facilities have been installed and a huge shelter building program has been undertaken. But the crucial task of ensuring that each and every one of the refugees has enough to eat each week is the responsibility of the Bangladesh Red Crescent with financial and technical support from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. During the first hundred days of this food distribution program, beginning on the 29th of January, the number of refugees has increased from 28,000 centered around one camp to almost 250,000 sheltering in 12 separate locations. Even so, the elderly, the disabled, men, women and children have received sufficient food regularly to keep them alive. A considerable achievement acknowledged by the refugees themselves and senior relief officials. There is not a single death of starvation and also there is no uh, major complaint in food distribution. And also I didn't find any people uh, was hunger without getting food. So from that point of view I should say that the food distribution program was a great achievement. But why are Abu Shama and his family here at all? Since the early 1940s, there has been a history of tension between the Rohingyas living in the Arakan province of Myanmar and other ethnic groups. In 1978, some 200,000 Rohingyas fled to southern Bangladesh, subsequently returning with the agreement of both governments. In 1992, the scale of the problem has intensified as an even greater number have poured into the Deknaf registration centers, including Abu Shama. We crossed the river by boat and reached Tekna. We waited three days to obtain our registration card. At first, we had to stay outside the camp, but after 15 days, we got a shelter from the government. The Red Crescent gave us rations each week, and we are just able to survive on these. Aid agencies and the Bangladesh government have long experience of disaster management, primarily through the cyclone preparedness and response programs. This is just as well, since the number of refugees in the camps and holding areas has doubled regularly, from 28,000 at the start of the Red Crescent operation in late January, to 67,000 by the end of the following month. There was a huge surge during the first 10 days of March to 134,000 and by the end of the first 100 days in early May, the total had nearly doubled again to almost 250,000. As the influx increased, so did the number of camps. Just one camp was established when the Red Crescent activity began. By the first week of May, 12 were operational with another two planned. These statistics highlight the considerable challenges facing the Bangladesh Red Crescent, which is to post experienced officers, supported by volunteers, 
to ensure that the food distribution in each of the camps runs smoothly right from the start. This may be one problem solved for Mitchell Carlson, head of UNHCR's sub-office in Cox's Bazaar, but he faces a number of others. Well, there are four basic problems, I would say. Uh, the first one being the shortage of land, the lack of space for the refugees to live on. Second is the number of people without shelter. Uh, the third has been, in some camps, a serious shortage of water, which has uh, caused problems nutritionally and health-wise. And related to that is the fourth problem, is sanitation. We have some serious sanitation problems in the camp. The, the health situation could deteriorate very, very quickly. The Bangladesh Red Crescent Society has been delivering food to all the camps uh, they've, in some cases, only had 24 hours notice to bring food into a camp that sprung up overnight. They've responded very well, very quickly, and we have good cooperation with them and with the government of Bangladesh. The food distribution program has certainly kept starvation at bay. Since we were uh, distributing approximately 1,000 tons per week, we had to ensure that the foodstuff will arrive in the camps on time. For that, we were using the fleet of uh, Bangladesh Red Crescent Society, but in addition, we had to hire local transport to achieve our goal. The uh, cooperation uh, between BDRCS and the International Federation was excellent. The BDRCS, they have a long-standing uh, cooperation in other projects as well as relief activities. And uh, I was very much satisfied with the performance of the Bangladesh Red Crescent Society in that respect. Federation support was initially focused on an appeal to national societies, targeted at raising over three million Swiss francs. In fact, by early May, five million had been pledged in cash, kind or services by 16 national societies, seven governments and the European community. The response to the appeal has been very generous and we are very happy about that, that we have received uh, from various national societies and governments, including uh, EC. And uh, I think uh, the people, especially the refugees, are very grateful for that. The money has been well spent. And during the first 100 days, the Red Crescent distributed either from its own resources or supplied by the World Food Programme over 6,000 tons of rice, a thousand tons of dal, nearly 400 tons of oil, over 50 tons of salt, almost 172,000 pieces of soap, over seven and a half thousand blankets and nine tons of biscuits. By the 8th of May, when the world traditionally celebrates Red Cross Red Crescent Day, 245,283 refugees had benefited from these distributions. Ensuring that the relief items reached the camps on schedule and in the correct quantities for the 50,000 families requires meticulous planning and attention to detail. The camps are supplied from three main warehouses with Red Crescent staff carefully overseeing and signing out each consignment Deliveries to the camps generally take place the day before food is needed and stored overnight in secure warehouses close by the distribution centers. For Abu Shama and his family, the food chain begins with a ration card provided by the Red Crescent following government registration. The head of each household must produce this card before receiving the relief items. Each camp maintains a master role for auditing with receipt confirmed by the beneficiary, usually through a thumb impression. For Abu Shama and his family of eight, the weekly food basket comprises rice, 28 kilograms, dal, almost four kilograms, oil, just over one kilogram, 280 grams of salt and two pieces of soap. Thanks to the skill and commitment of the Red Crescent International Federation team in Cox's Bazaar and Taka, 
the Shama family have enough to eat. If we did not get food from the Red Crescent, my family would not be able to survive. We are very grateful to everyone who has helped us. How many camps you have visited today, Omar? These words are particularly encouraging for Muhammad Nasirullah, the Red Crescent's relief coordinator in Cox's Bazaar and his hard-working team of staff and volunteers. It is a very tough operation. Uh, we have about uh, 50 officers and staff and more than 300 volunteers are working around the clock. Uh, many, many officers and volunteers are working from uh, 6 o'clock in the morning and uh, till evening also. Uh, everybody is getting the food and we have covered uh, all the refugees. Nobody is without food. Each evening, Nasir receives returns from the camps with the day's distribution figures. A central file is maintained at the Cox's Bazaar control room, where the data is also prominently displayed on a master board. But what of the future? The appalling plight of the refugees cannot be allowed to continue indefinitely. There are three options for the refugees. One, either they are to be taken by third countries, or they are to live in Bangladesh in perpetuity, or they are to go back home. First two options are not viable. The only third option is viable. While officials from both the Bangladesh and the Myanmar governments seek a solution, Ali Hassan Qureshi, Secretary General of the Bangladesh Red Crescent, addresses the humanitarian imperatives. The Rohingya refugees indeed represent a major humanitarian problem. 250,000 displaced people is a large number. The Bangladesh Red Crescent Society's operation has been carried out in the spirit of the movement's best humanitarian traditions. Whatever may be the political decisions, there is a strong commitment within the Bangladesh Red Crescent that with the support of the sister national societies and the International Federation, we would continue to provide humanitarian assistance to the refugees for as long as they are required to stay here. And that could at least be till the end of 1992. Abu Shama has more than enough time to reflect on his position. The last word should come from him. I love my country Burma, but we have to live in Bangladesh at present and will stay here until the time is right for our return.